We are going to defeat the radical socialist Democrats, and we are going to win Arizona in a landslide. All eyes were on Arizona last night as President Trump rallied in Phoenix. The top highlights headed your way. Someone has to show that they're opposed to the course of events in the country. And so we're here just to add a few more people to that number. You know, we, we have to show that there is opposition. Plus, protesting the president. We go inside the free speech area to find out what message demonstrators hope to send his loyal supporters. And Bloomberg battles it out on the Democratic debate stage. We sat down with his longtime partner to see what she thinks about the political backlash. That is horse feathers. I've known this man for 20 years, and he respects everybody. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening, and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Jamie Landers. And I'm Julian Paras. Thank you for joining us. Last night, President Donald Trump packed the house for his Keep America Great rally in Phoenix. He spent more than 80 minutes making a case for his reelection. Reporter Danielle Malkin was there, and she joins us now with an inside look at what went on. During his speech here at Veterans Memorial Coliseum tonight, President Trump made no shortage of jabs at his Democratic challengers while praising Arizonans for the power they bring to the polls. Trump fans, young and old, filled Veterans Memorial Coliseum Wednesday night for an event that welcomed the president to Arizona for the first time since launching his 2020 re-election campaign. Thank you very much, Phoenix. We love to be back. We'll be back a lot. Trump took Arizona in the 2016 election, and GOP lawmakers believe it will happen again come November. Arizona is on fire thanks to the leadership of President Trump with Governor Doug Ducey and the Republicans and the Senate and the House. People are living amazing. We are getting people off the sidelines. The economy is doing so great. We have so much more to do. Oh, I think he's going to easily get reelected. Now, we can't rest on our laurels because I've seen firsthand how the Democrats will do anything and say anything to grab back power. Poverty has plummeted. To the, the president excited rate. crowds with talk of a booming economy, shrinking unemployment, and his desire to keep Arizonans protected from a Democrat victory. We are going to defeat the radical socialist Democrats, and we are going to win Arizona in a landslide. Trump also took the opportunity to weigh in on Senate candidate Mark Kelly, who will face off against incumbent Martha McSally this fall. He wants to raise your taxes, open your borders, give away free health care to illegal immigrants, and he wants to obliterate your Second Amendment. He wants to get rid of it. A sea of red met the president, and the crowd knew just what he wanted to hear. A promise that can only be kept, according to campaign leadership, if Trump voters on both sides of the aisle cast those ballots come November. The Trump coalition is big, uh, and it includes many Democrats. In fact, routinely what we see at Trump rallies is that about a quarter of those attending are Democrats. Uh, party affiliation means less in the Trump era, where Democrats have crossed the line and supported the president, um, along with Republicans who have done so to the tune of 97 percent. President Trump told crowds tonight that he stood for the people of Arizona, and in return, they stood for him, applauding his stance on Second Amendment rights, school of choice, and keeping Arizona red. Reporting in Phoenix, Danielle Malkin, Cronkite News. One moment that went viral during the rally last night was when a World War II veteran made his entrance into the Coliseum. In this video, you can see two other attendees carry the man down a flight of stairs to his seat as the crowd begins chanting, USA. The president later identified him as 100-year-old Navy veteran Irvin Julian and thanked him for his service. Donald Trump Jr. reacted on Twitter saying, this is the America I know. This is what Trump supporters are all about and what they stand for. And the president responded this morning tweeting, a really great moment. While President Trump spoke to supporters inside Veterans Memorial Coliseum, protesters filled the streets outside. Cronkite News reporter Dylan McKim spoke to some of them about why they came out and what they hope to accomplish. Dylan. The protesters came from all walks of life, raising different issues that range from immigration and the border wall to foreign policy. Hey! 
everyone in attendance had their own reason for being there. Dennis Stout is a Vietnam War veteran. He knows the terrors of war and is worried for his three nephews and grandson who are in the military today. I'm not sure what our country's foreign policy is. There's nothing stated and no one's in charge. Everyone's an acting secretary. It's like there's no there's no clear purpose to what we're doing. High school students from the Gila River community came out with signs to protest the border wall. Gabriella Hart is an Akama Otham woman and wanted to show support for the Tahana Otham, their sister tribe. The wall that he is building is running through tribal sacred grounds that are burial grounds, and we wanted to, that's something that we're very much against. There were many different issues raised by everyone in the protest, but they all had one thing in common. Someone has to show that they're opposed to the course of events in the country. And so we're here just to add a few more people to that number. You know, we, we have to show that there is opposition. Phoenix police took to Twitter this morning to thank community members and other law enforcement agencies for ensuring safety all around the event. For Cronkite News, I'm Dylan McKim. To share these stories with your friends and family, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And to take a look at how much this rally could cost the state, just go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Nearly 20 million viewers tuned in to last night's Democratic primary debate in Las Vegas, making it the most watched Democratic primary debate of all time, according to preliminary numbers. And the spotlight was on Mike Bloomberg for most of it. He took to the debate stage for the first time, facing fire from all sides. While the former mayor of New York City tried to focus on his campaign vision, the other candidates kept challenging him on his political and personal history. I'd like to talk about who we're running against. A billionaire who calls women fat broads and horse-faced lesbians. And no, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. I'm talking about Mayor Bloomberg. Between a socialist who thinks that capitalism is the root of all evil and a billionaire who thinks that money ought to be the, the root of all power. Let's put forward somebody who actually lives and works in a middle-class neighborhood in an industrial Midwestern city. Let's put forward somebody who's actually a Democrat. Look. <laughs> Bloomberg defended himself against the attacks by saying he's the only candidate who can beat Trump. We have two questions to face tonight. One is, who can beat Donald Trump? And number two, who can do the job if they get into the White House? And I would argue that I am the candidate that can do exactly both of those things. While Bloomberg took the heat at last night's debate, his long-term partner, Diana Taylor, was in Tempe, talking with ASU President Michael Crow. Cronkite News reporter Frankie McLister was there to find out why. Diana Taylor talked about education with Arizona State University's President Michael Crow, but she also defended Bloomberg's actions and work ethic. That is horse feathers. I've known this man for 20 years, and he respects everybody. That's how Diana Taylor responded when asked about controversial statements Michael Bloomberg has been accused of saying. These include calling a hypothetical transgender person it, and telling a married pregnant employee to kill it. Michael Bloomberg is a man of total and complete integrity. Bloomberg's longtime partner of 20 years was in Tempe visiting with ASU President Michael Crow. Their goal is to work together on education if Bloomberg wins November's presidential election. We need an opportunity to uh, renew the design of our national education systems and our local education systems so that everyone has the chance to be a fulfilled learner, a total learner, a universal learner. We're not doing that yet, so we need a new design. The two and some members of their team spent about 30 minutes chatting at the ASU president's office. Taylor then met with women's student organizations on the Tempe campus. The current pinned tweet on the top of Bloomberg's Twitter page states, my parents taught me about hard work, honesty, and sacrifice. Growing up in Medford, Massachusetts, I shoveled snow, cut lawns, and sold Christmas wreaths. I want to give everybody in this country the opportunity to thrive and be happy, and I'll bring that work ethic to the White House. Taylor also touched a bit on Bloomberg's work ethic. He was an Eagle Scout, so that just basically says everything about him. Being an Eagle Scout, you're all about integrity, honesty, hard work, and giving back. 
and that's who he is. Yes. Change the educational system in this yes. country. Right. <laughs> Bro is not endorsing Bloomberg for president, but he's simply happy to work with Diana Taylor if Bloomberg wins the race. Look out November because he's going to be the president of the United States. And if so, will you pursue the role as the first lady? Of course, absolutely. So we want to hear from you now. How do you think Bloomberg performed during the debate? Deborah says he did a great job of showing us how much he's just like Trump, arrogant and angry. Mickey Hamilton chimed in with exactly how I expected. And Mickey McCormick wrote, he looked like the central figure in an episode of Intervention. And it's not too late to join the conversation. Just go to our Cronkite News Facebook and Twitter feeds to weigh in. Early voting began yesterday for Arizona's Democratic presidential primary election. Here's what you need to know. More than 900,000 ballots are being sent to those who signed up to vote by mail. The four-week election period ends on March 17th. Democrats who didn't sign up to get early ballots can request one from county officials until March 6th or vote in person either at an early voting site or their election day polling place. Arizona will have 18 Democrats on the ballot although seven have formally ended their campaigns and more are likely to do so before March 17th. Republican and Libertarian parties are not holding primaries. Coming up next on Cronkite News at 5, why holding cells at the border facilities in Tucson have been deemed unconstitutional. And two gun rallies in less than a week, both taking aim at different gun rights issues. We'll explain after the break. Welcome to this Tuesday Cronkite News Update here on Facebook Live. I'm Kelly Donahue. Here are the top stories we're tracking for you today at noon. Apple has issued a warning that there may be a shortage of iPhones due to the coronavirus outbreak in China. The company said the virus is affecting its production more than expected. Because most iPhones are manufactured in China, there's a decrease in the amount it can sell and make. Apple temporarily closed all of its stores in China and told investors this will temporarily affect revenue worldwide. And the latest on the battle of rideshare fees at Phoenix Sky Harbor. The State House panel voted along party lines to advance the proposal to bar fees on ride hailing companies like Uber and Lyft. The four member majority voted for the proposal, saying it stops Phoenix from violating a voter approved ban on new taxes or fees on services. Birds of a feather flock together, except in this case of two unusual best friends. Herman the Pigeon and Little Lundy, a Chihuahua puppy, went viral when the Mia Foundation posted this video of the two of them cuddling. The rescue organization rehabilitates animals with physical deformities. Herman the Pigeon suffered neurological damage more than a year ago and, as a result, can no longer fly. And Lundy can't walk. It's unknown if Herman and Lundy will stay together, Lundy may already have a new home lined up. The question is if the new owner will adopt Herman too. And Stephanie Bates is standing by with a look at how soon we could hit the 80s. Stephanie? Yes, Kelly, that might be a lot sooner than we thought. We've got a beautiful day here in Phoenix, currently sitting at 67 degrees here in Phoenix. The high country in Grand Canyon is at 42. Flagstaff is right behind them at 41 degrees. And the lower Colorado River Valley in Yuma is feeling the warmest temperature in the state right now at 69 degrees. Now heading into this evening, we've got the sunset at 6.15 p.m. and mostly clear skies throughout the night. If you're headed out for that Taco Tuesday, bring a light jacket. We're going to trail off into the 60s right after that 8 o'clock hour. Now, even though warm temperatures are upon us, we do have cold temperatures in those late night and early morning hours. We're going to have a low of 51 degrees here in Phoenix for tomorrow. Prescott with a low of 29, Sedona 41, and the high country in Grand Canyon will have a low of 19 degrees for tomorrow. Now, looking ahead at the next three days, we are flirting with 80 degrees tomorrow, and we'll definitely see our first 80 degree day of the year by Thursday. 80 degrees for our high on Friday with some clouds. Tune into Cronkite News at 5 p.m., where I will be breaking down your whole weekend forecast. Residents of Yavapai County are still looking for answers after hundreds reported hearing a loud boom south of Prescott. Officials say the culprit could be a falling meteor exploding in the atmosphere. Robert Ward was able to capture this picture in the moments after the boom was heard. More than 64 people reported seeing a fireball to the American Meteor Society. Now, enthusiasts and scientists are hunting for fragments of it. Coming up tonight on Cronkite News at 5, everything you need to know about President Trump's upcoming visit to the Valley. 
and a look inside one of Arizona's largest nuclear plants and how it's taking steps to reduce its water usage. January of this year was the warmest January on record for the globe. That's according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Cronkite News reporter Isabella Holsizer joins us now to explain what this means for Arizona. For January, Arizona's temperatures didn't increase all that much, but check out what's happening across the globe. The average January temperature increased the most in Asia, specifically Russia, which had temperatures that were at least nine degrees or higher than average. Overall, this was Asia's second warmest January on record. The same goes for South America. The continent experienced its second highest January temperatures from the average on record since 1910. Here in the U.S., it was the fifth warmest January on record. The darker orange shows much warmer than averages along the East Coast, and even states like Arizona were above their historic averages. No state ranked average or below average for the month. But here in Arizona, temperatures were warmer for January, but not much above average compared to the 20th century averages. Phoenix, Flagstaff, and Tucson increased less than one degree, and overall Arizona has experienced a 3.2 degree increase from its historic average. Really, really dry winter um, that we've seen in the past, but it's, it's been a little drier than normal. We haven't seen the winter storms come down and dip into the state as much as we would normally see. Sullivan predicts the rest of this winter will be dry, which could make for a dry spring. And in that case, we could be looking at a very busy wildfire season. In downtown Phoenix, Isabella Holsizer, Cronkite News. All right, and based off of that report, I mean, you can only imagine how much hotter it's going to get, or colder for that matter. So, I mean, what can you tell us, you know, heading into this weekend and what we can expect? Yes, Julian, um, things here in the Valley especially have begun to start heating up. And I'll just go ahead and show you guys what I'm talking about, starting okay. with the weather coming in from Phoenix Sky Harbor. Cronkite News starts now. What you're about to see is a first for the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Within seven days, we've developed an innovative way to create a daily newscast remotely from our homes across the country. This is a work in progress, but we are proud to provide our audience with the latest information on the global coronavirus pandemic and how it's affecting Arizona. So here's a look at the latest local numbers. As of today, five people here in Arizona have died from the coronavirus with 100 new cases being reported since yesterday. That brings the total Arizona cases of COVID-19 to 326. The World Health Organization is reporting for every one person who's infected with COVID-19, they could transmit the deadly virus to two more people. Then those two people could infect four more people. It only takes 20 jumps like this to infect over 1 million people. At this rate, officials say we can expect the number of cases to double every six days. That means by the end of April, there could be at least 1 million cases of COVID-19 in the United States alone. Arizona health officials have now reported eight deaths and 508 cases of COVID-19. As the numbers continue to grow, they warn this is just the beginning of the coronavirus crisis in our state. The number of cases is expected to double every six days. During a news conference, the Arizona Department of Health Services director said they're preparing rapidly to increase the number of equipment and supplies to brace for peak hospitalizations in mid-May. We anticipate that we could need an additional 13,000 hospital beds and an additional 1,500 ICU beds. That's um, on top of the current 16,000 beds and 1,500 ICU beds. We believe that the peak of our, our illnesses will start mid to um, end of April with peak hospitalizations in May. This is the first time the Department of Health Services has given an estimate on when Arizona will reach its COVID-19 peak. Over the weekend, the Arizona National Guard state surgeon visited the Navajo Nation. He delivered 200 pieces of personal protective equipment to help the tribe combat the spread of COVID-19. As of Monday, the state health department reported 210 positive coronavirus cases in Navajo County, the third highest in the state. Navajo Nation spans Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico. The COVID-19 crisis has put a hold on all major league baseball games for the time being. But the MLB is discussing several options to resume playing as early as May. And one potential plan 
is to make Phoenix the home to all 30 MLB teams for the 2020 baseball season. The Valley is considered a prime location because of the Chase Stadium and our 10 spring training fields. Now, baseball fans shouldn't get their hopes too high. In a statement, the MLB confirmed the plan is being considered, but they say it's far from a sure thing. The United States Supreme Court decided they will now hear May arguments by teleconference. The court has postponed hearing March and April cases because of the coronavirus. Six of the nine justices are over 65 years old, putting them at high risk of death from the illness. Ten key cases are scheduled to be heard this month, including President Trump's fight to shield his tax and financial records from release. The court also announced they'll make live stream audio from the hearing available for the first time.